Um, so this is our, our, our disclaimer, of course, because Mariana and I are, are, are not really using our materials for, <laughs> or at least yeah. our slides in, in full. Um, but she had reminded me that, uh, oh yeah, these are, uh, these are probably copyrighted by people. So, uh, we will take no, no credit for them. Uh, but some of the, I guess just, just our verbal knowledge, but, um, but the images themselves are, are by other people. So, yeah, um, I, I do want to kind of start us off just so we're all on the kind of the same page about what, what is color and how do we describe color? Um, and there's three really three components to this that we can kind of discuss, uh, and they really are hue, uh, which is any of the color names. So this is this is kind of the more ambiguous part of it because you could say, well, it's red, or you can also say it's like burnt carmine. Those are both hues, um, more more of a specific. So it, it can get as basic or as complex as possible. Uh, the value of the color uh, is strictly the color based on a black and white scale. So my my normal scale for uh, for value is a 10 point gray scale uh, where I designate uh, white light as in the sun is 10 and black hole outer space is zero. So actually our, our scales between one and nine for the most part, uh, nine being white paper, black being uh, or one being black paint. Our chroma is kind of a, on a different scale than a one to 10 because we are still developing new uh, pigments out there, uh, discovering, I should say, and developing uh, new colors, and, and which are more intense than just our 10 point grayscale. So often when we talk about chroma, it, the higher the number, the more intense that color will be. Uh, so often you'll have a, um, a color where if you're using a Monzel system, we'll have a, a chroma of like 14 or 16, where you have like a really intense orange um, and, and we're still finding new colors just like the what's the new blue called i can't remember minion minion blue which makes me think of the little minions but that's okay right, right. <laughs> um but just as a nutshell he was the name of the color the value is based on the gray scale between one and, and nine for the most part uh, it's d how light the color is how dark the color is and chroma is basically how intense the color is uh there's two types of colors that we have to um really discuss before we get into pigments. Uh, we'll start off with additive color, which uh, anyone who's kind of worked in the theater kind of industry has seen, uh, you know, kind of the lights with the filters that are colored uh, and you'll have like a red spotlight that you put on the actor to get a cer certain mood. Uh, and I remember uh, a field trip that our, 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 one of our classes in Baltimore uh, took when I was at Maryland Institute College of Arts to, to uh, I think it was center stage or one of those places. Uh, they had spotlights on the stage and then they would shine a red spotlight and they had another one with a green spotlight and they slid over and turned yellow right on the stage. And then again, they had another one, they had a blue spotlight and they shifted that over and all these three colored spotlights it turned out to be one white spotlight in the very end. And that's really because the wavelengths of all these colors are, are compounding to become white. So to create cyan, you would use a green spotlight and a blue spotlight, or this would also work in your computer screens and things like that. Mm -hmm. Anything emitting light or red spotlight, a blue spotlight will create a magenta spotlight or color, I should say. Um, but it's really kind of thinking about those wavelengths to create them. So anyone who's played with your computer in Photoshop or Procreate or, or kind of more um, I guess accustomed to this is your color wheel where you have that white in the center. Uh, and these are really just rainbow based colors. Right. Um, but our, 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 our primers are a little bit different. We have uh, red, green, blue instead of cyan, magenta, and yellow as our primary colors. It's important to know about this though, because even though we're working with subtractive color with our pigments and paints, we're still trying to recreate a an additive color world that we world. accept. So it, without really kind of understanding the way the rainbow, the rainbow works, the additive color works, uh, it's we have to kind of interpret and make that adjustment as artists between the additive color world and subtractive color world. Uh, and I, we'll talk a little bit about subtractive color as well. Uh, so probably on the left there is your more standardized color wheel that you probably grew up with, with your primary colors being uh, yellow, red, and blue. Of course, you get your secondary colors and orange, green, and purple, and then those split off into tertiary colors as well. Kind of a hybrid between a, a secondary and a primary color. Um, 
I think for me, at least this, this is almost uh, irrelevant as an artist. I've removed uh, my knowledge, or <laughs> tried to remove my knowledge of the old school, what I was taught in kindergarten, as much as possible from the way I teach and the way I think. Um, I even, even told my children, if you're, if you're a, uh, art teachers ever tell you the primary colors and if they say the wrong primary colors you are fully welcome to correct your teacher <laughs> <laughs> so um and this is of course a dad story but like they were at summer camp over at Glen Echo with Emma and Emma uh notified me that they definitely know the correct primary colors and I said you're welcome <laughs> anyway um but um, you may know your uh, subtractive primary colors strictly by looking at your printer. So if you have a printer on your desk next to your computer right now, uh, you pop it open. More often than not, your, your printer colors and the cartridges that you have to replace for way more money than you really should are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, and I think if you're a, an artist trying to start a new medium and trying to figure out what your medium should do, or if you want to even pursue like liquid acrylics, for instance, Starting out with those cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and white, that kind of, uh, those five colors, well, the three colors plus black and white, I think is a really easy way to kind of start out uh, with, with learning to paint in a new medium. Um, but the way subtractive color works is really it's what's, what's being absorbed by the surface that the light is hitting versus what's being reflected. So over on the diagram on the, uh, on the right there, uh, we have white light coming from uh, the sun. And of course, it's the entire spectrum of the rainbow. And that surface that's textured is absorbing all the colors but green. So we visually describe the, su the, the subject as green simply by that's the color that's bouncing back off the surface into our retina. And that's how we describe it as, as green. Now, some surfaces will have a little bit of green, a little bit of yellow reflected, and then we'll see, of course, like this kind of yellowish green kind of color. Does that make sense? <laughs> For now. Oh, my, my slide got a little yeah. smaller, but uh, there's the two color wheels side by side, although one is much smaller for whatever reason. Um, we want to minimize it, that's yeah, why. There we go. <laughs> um, but you can see that the two are, are similar, but kind of opposites at the same way with that center being black with the subtractive color and with out of color because the wavelengths are compounding and getting, getting closer to white light the center will become white. Um, in, all, in all actuality, if you add cyan, magenta, and yellow, it's kind of more brownish rather than pure black, but that's why your printer also often has a CMYK, and the K stands for black uh, in your printer and in printing. Uh, and they don't use B for black, obviously, because there's blue, and people would get confused. So, uh -huh. yeah. Thank you for making that point. I never knew that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, our wavelengths. Do you want to talk about this, Mariana? Or? Sure, sure. Does it continue to my slide? Or because we, we sort of divvied up different slides, but yeah, I can. Color is, of course, our main tool as artists. And um, uh, so, but we we work as humans, we work in a very small portion of the whole um, universal wavelength possibilities. And those are the what we call visible light, just because we can view it. Um, other animals that have different rods and cones in their brain and in their retinas um, can perceive many more colors than we do. Um, but in any case, here is kind of the spectrum of all um, universal magnetic, um, electromagnetic spectrum and where we stand, which is a little sliver. But of course, if magnifying it, we have what we call the roid bib, vib. Um, spectrum that we all sort of learned as a mnemonic as well as that we are familiar with. Um, so next slide, please. And so we wanted to talk about what is paint. So paint can be thought of as a pigment and we'll talk about all these terms today. So we wanted to introduce you to them uh, just so that we all have the kind of the same understanding of what we mean. The pigment, which we think about as particulate, right? As a powder uh, most of the time because pigments are sort of sold as powders as well as in tubes and all the other formulations we know. But if you just had pigment, you could have a little vial with uh, some powder of a certain color 
and that's sort of the pure uh, pigment and then you can make watercolors from it, you can make oils from it, you can make acrylics or a variety of other things. The pigment in the binder, and we'll go more into this later, is when the pigment is in suspension, like usable. So that, but the binder has a very important role, which is to maintain the pigment in a sort of suspension that, um, that remains, oops, uh, that remains, um, uh, Oops, that remains in, in the same state, no matter whether you're brushing it on or uh, pouring it or whatever. So the pigment, the binder has a very important role with respect to the pigment, which is to maintain the particles in a very uniform um, arrangement. And then finally, the pigment binder and solvent is plus or minus solvent, and I use solvent in quotes because solvent can be water also. Uh, we're not talking about just toxic versus non-toxic or anything. Um, the solvent is the, the medium that allows the brushing of that, of that um, pigment or the, the interaction with a substrate like the canvas. So broadly speaking, keep this in mind. Next slide. So in reality, this is the um, scenario that paint equals, and by paint, we mean oil paint, tempera, pastel, alkyds, casein, whatever you want to think about, including house paint, by the way. Um, it contains pigment and the pigment can be organic or inorganic. Inorganic are the mostly the ones that are found in the earth that, um, that our early ancestors painted with you know, a rock that looked reddish might have been used to, to sort of, um, to represent a human being or an animal on a cave uh, wall. The organics are also available to our ancestors, which, um, but the, or when we say organic, they contain carbon com compounds. And in general, they can be both found and uh, produced. So most of the sort of new development of pigments is in the organic category because people are making experiments or looking for other things like Minion was not intended, the new color that uh, Jordan mentioned before was found by serendipity in the search for something else. They weren't trying to find a new blue, but all of a sudden things precipitated and they were brilliant blue. Um, so that's what's being, um, captured and marketed, but it was an organic compound that was uh, meant for something else. Um, anyway, so, so, and it's a little bit more rare to find an inorganic now that, it, but we are still, you know, mining the earth. So I just heard a section on NPR this morning that lithium is very yellow. And so mining of lithium is yellow. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. And so the bind, so we talked about the pigment, the binder can be anything, uh, oils, proteins, carbohydrates, like um, gums, like the acacia tree gum, which is like a resin kind of that pours off the tree, like maple from making maple syrup. That's what's used in watercolor paints, like gum Arabic, we, we know it as. So in a whole variety of possibilities. The fillers and additives. Now, this is important because it has to do with how, say we want a drier paint. We, you want a soft body or, or a, um, or a um, what do you call the, the, I always want to say hard body, but that's not it. Sure. No. Yeah, the full body <laughs> sort of tube paints, yeah. right? As opposed to one that you pour or that is a creamy, creamy paint. Um, and they have some dryers and some stabilizers like glycerin. So that's so we're giving you the whole the whole possibilities that can could come into making paint. And then diluents, which can be the solvents, and it's water, acetone, spirits, whatever you want to think about. And the key to the diluents and and to some extent the fillers and additives is that they either evaporate or oxidize away from the paint. So then in other words, you have the whole, um, what remains when your paint 
dries or cures is mostly your pigment. Uh, thank you. And so sometimes you see and um, you will notice in tubes that you, they'll distinguish the pigment, the brighten. It, so this is a, a, a formulation of watercolor, but it's kind of applicable because it has the whole spectrum of things. Pigment, you can have a brightener, you can have a binder, which in this case is gum Arabic, but it can be honey, et cetera. Plasticizer, glycerin, it makes it not dry the moment, uh, the moment it hits the sun, but just close to it. A humectant, um, which means adds humidity. Uh, an extender like dextrin, dispersants, and then water, in particular for watercolors. Next slide. And in acrylics, it, this is a more simplified depiction water and acrylic binder, the pigment, of course, and quote, additional agents. And you just heard me go through some possibilities of additional agents in water-based paints. Next oil slide. paint is, and oil paint is actually a little bit uh, more simplistic, I think. I mean, a lot of artists, at least in grad school, had this kind of kick of just making their own paint. For, for oil painters, it's really, you can get away with just pigment and oil and to make oil paint, but it's really- Right sounds a little bit primitive and you can add other things. There's other paint brands. I can't remember the, uh, the one off the top of my head, the German brand, I think it starts with an M, but it, they add a uh, DeMar varnish to their paint mixture. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's an additive, but it's designed to make the colors a little bit more, uh, more glossy and vibrant and kind of closer to a Rubens painting without constantly adding uh, an unknowable quantity of DeMar varnish, which can be a little bit unstable to your paints as you go. Um, so it's, they do that on purpose, but it's a very expensive brand of paint, but in all actuality, oil paint's very simple in that regard. Yeah, in that you can, you, it, the oil is both functioning maybe as the binder and the dispersant or the solvent. Yeah. yeah. And then you so add what, the spirits later, but yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what, what we wanted to make sure that we all know the artist solvent should evaporate completely, and that can be through evaporation of water or oxidation, as in the oil components. Evaporate at a uniform rate and mix completely with the materials because you want them not to alter. So some sections are drying before others um, because that would alter your work. Uh, it should have no effect on the dried paint layers so that it shouldn't have a different uh, constitution or a different um, uh, appearance after, after the paint dries. So you would say, oh, there's the solvent and there's the pigment, how it precipitated away. It has to be chemically in, and physically inert. So, the, uh, so it doesn't alter anything about the paint. And you'll see why we say this in, in a moment in the next slides. It should have no toxic vapors, of course, um, and evaporate entirely or oxidize entirely. Um, so many solvents on the market do satisfy these. Some solvents don't. Uh, and, and for toxicity's sake, feel free to look at look always at the MSDS, the manufacturer safety data sheet for any compound that is in your, in your paints that you're, or your solvents that are, you're curious about. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Um, pigments in fine art, uh, they in, intrinsically do not dissolve in water. Paint is a dispersion of tiny pigment particles that are suspended in the vehicle or in the, the, the problem with this is that you, you now introduce the word vehicle, by the way, that they, what they mean is the binder. Um, just as the Mississippi River is a suspension of sand, clay, and, and chemicals that are, that flow through it. Um, all professional quality, um, tube and pan colors, and I should say colors, not just watercolors. In contrast, I wanted to point out that a dye is a different thing. It dissolves in water fully, binds directly with the materials it contacts through a mediating chemical called a mord mordant. Um, you don't have to remember any of these names, by the way. And for example, some brands of liquid watercolors will contain some dyes. So the caveat I wanna point out is the next bullet, which is dyes are not light fast. The majority of like colored inks that you buy um, if they don't say they're pigment-based, 
you can assume their dyes and they degrade on exposure to light. The same thing with neon colors uh, like uh, opera um, that some artists are kind of touting as wonderful colors to mix with um, or opera rose, which is a Windsor Newton color. They are neon colors and by in inherent nature, the bonds there are unstable. And so when, um, when exposed to light, they fade. So they're not light fast. So alcohol inks are also not light fast. And if you're curious about that or interested in working with alcohol inks, uh, Golden um, Just Paint newsletter has a fabulous um, article on how they tried to mix alcohol inks with a lot of varnishes, different kinds of varnishes. And it's very difficult to get the alcohol inks to actually be stable under a varnish, even by Golden, which is a very good company and they, they understand varnishes. So they basically, I would say, do not use them or use them with extreme caution. And I, um, I would try not to use them basically, alcohol inks. And, but apparently there has been a surge in the market for and a request and demand for alcohol inks because they are beautiful. And they, they, are, they are fun to work with too. So like the, I've been using the, the Copic markers uh, to sketch with in the plein air. And I mean, they obviously in a sketchbook, they kind of are closed books. Right. But a lot of light doesn't actually touch them, but I don't think of them as fin finished pieces. They're more or less kind of a, a quick documentation, a quick impression of the location. Right. Um, right. I, and I think a lot of the uh, artists who are working with the markers in specific are actually taking them and scanning them into a digital format afterwards. Uh, so a lot of the graphic novelists, a lot of the pen and inkers are, are translating or transferring that alcohol-based artwork into a digital format to use later on. Mm -hmm. Right, and, the, and of course the digital can be reproduced multiple times. And right. yeah. It can be That's as great. light fast as you want, because it is light. <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. So I, I just wanted to reiterate, I mean, we've used this in our classes and it, even though it's uh, this chart is generated by um, Bruce McAvoy, who owns the site handprint and it's uh, referred to here. If you do a Google search for handprint, it'll come up pretty first. Uh, but it's the best source we know for paint pigment numbers and their standardized pigment names. Now, we have a whole world out there of marketing marketing um, different paint uh, names. Like um, my favorite is to say midnight blue. What does that mean? You know, what is a midnight blue? I, uh, I would ask you what it is. And I, I bet you every single one of us would define a different color. If I asked you to paint something midnight blue, everybody would paint it a little bit differently. And what I'm trying to say is that there's very little standardization in the pigment uh, names and the pigment characteristics that they sell to us in the world out there. And so Bruce McAvoy a few years ago, like 2006 or so, uh, or a little bit earlier actually, he's a PhD chemist and has a lot of money. And so he actually um, did reflectance and precipitation and uh, physics kind of experiments with all the watercolors that exist out there. And he bought them himself. Some companies were offering him free samples and he rejected them because he said, I want to buy them and be an, an, an arbiter of what is out there in the market. And so he, knowing the, the one standardization we know of is the pigment name and with a pigment number. And so in, um, we have for example, at the top of the chart, you have PY97 Hansa yellow. And he mapped it on a, on a color wheel, showing you what pigment called Hansa yellow and what number goes with it that is located approximately on that side of the color wheel. As you might know, as a general, uh, we, we represent our colors in a color wheel for convenience and it's a, based on a system of, of characterizing them that kind of loops onto itself. That's why it's a wheel. But basically all the colors that are closer to the edges of the wheel are a little more, are, are closer to their full saturation. Okay, so as you can see, none of the colors are 
kind of a, a what would be a, a wavelength yellow, all right? So they, they fall short. Remember, they're all um, uh, subtracted pigments, and that's how we paint in that when you mix two paints, two colors together, you get a less intense color by definition, right? Mm -hmm. So what you, so, so this chart is showing the very best of any pigment that is out there that you can buy and, and how close or away from full saturation or chroma in the sort of light wavelength they would look like but they're the best colors we have. So I like to refer to this chart sometimes when a teacher tells me, oh, you have to buy this Courbet green for, the, for my workshop. And I go, what's Courbet green? And I look at the components and I may be able to find out what pigment names and numbers are included in them. And so it kind of standardizes um, the, the field a little bit better. Now this was done with watercolors. No one to our knowledge um, has done this for oils, acrylics, et cetera, et cetera. So actually this chart is being used by James Gurney and many other people who, who write about color, even though it, uh, it was generated with um, watercolors to begin with. I have a okay. question, Mariana. Yes. Are yes, go any, ahead. Are there any pigment colors that are uh, more prone to not drying well, cracking, et cetera? Or are they all pretty much on a level playing field? Very good question. Um, yes, and they behave differently most of the time because of the binder and the solvent that is used. So that's an excellent question that Ian is proposing and, and it's exactly at the core of good quality paints or bad quality paints. But these are sort of standard. Now notice that in the middle he wrote, he put some that have no number. Olive green has, and sap green and hooker's green. That's because, and he explains in his text and his website, which is voluminous, that um, those are convenience colors, meaning manufacturers of different brands have, um, put together a couple of different greens that add up to make a sap green, for example, and, and that that is not standardized. So we don't have a pigment number because there are multiple pigments in them. So having said that, it doesn't mean they're bad colors. It just means that they will mix differently when you take a, a phthalo green, for example, um, which is a single pigment color versus a convenience color, which is a mixture of whatever the manufacturer uses as approximating the color sap green or the look of a sap green, whatever that is. Um, and then they're a mixture. So they will behave differently. However, having said that, the ones that are on here are colors that are reliable. So that, does that begin to answer your question, Ian? Because there's several answers to your question. Ian, are you asking about of cracking and fading like light fast as well, or just like they're just gonna fall apart on the surface? More just falling apart on the surface and longevity, I guess. Yeah, how they're gonna dry over yeah. time. Right. Yeah, I think the it's hard to find pigments that are gonna fall apart or, or if they fall apart, will probably be dead by then. Um, because it does take a little bit of time for the, it takes a hundred years for oil paint to actually dry in the first place. Yeah. Oil paint. Um, others, well, I can go in acrylic as well, but, uh, you know, with oil paint, it has that longevity and the ones that are cracking and falling apart are really, really old. So you, honestly, you'll never know. <laughs> um, yeah. With acrylic paint, um, like I, I, I read somewhere, I cannot remember for life me where, but like the original space helmet for Buzz Aldrin, which was acrylic based, was melting in the uh, in the, uh, 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 the Smithsonian downtown. It was like falling apart because at that time period, acrylic was brand new and uh -huh. it hasn't hadn't been time tested. So uh, a lot of the artists who were working in early stages of acrylic, you know, recoat paints, were going, "Oh crap, our paint, paints are going to fall apart," just like the the space helmet uh, was doing. So. If you are an acrylic based artist, you don't have the hundred plus years of longevity uh, that we know of, you know, that we know oil paint will last a hundred years. 
um, at least, you know, we have Da Vinci's 16 something rather. Uh, so we have lots of history with oil paint, but less of history with acrylic paint. And as much as gold and all these amazing companies are touting that acrylic will last forever and scientists are guessing it'll last forever, we just can't possibly have that duration right. uh, that oil yeah. paint does. So it's it's a crapshoot in a lot of ways. Yeah. Having said that, we do have a history, long history of casein. Um, it, uh, casein is a watercolor type paint that's based on um, that incorporates an egg yolk, and that was used for early frescoes on board and things like that. So you'll see fantastic artworks from the 14th century still beautifully exhibited and not fading in the, in the presence of light uh, in museums. Um, so you can, um, and, and, uh, and of course, frescoes uh, on walls and, yeah. you know, Tia Polo, um, you most likely used a combination of, uh, of gypsum and, uh, and pigment mixed together to make the fresco and it stayed on the wall. Um, yeah. One more yeah. thing about this slide. Uh, oh, go. Ahead. Is there a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, my my question is simple. I'm always confused about the names of the, the colors. Yeah, every everyone <laughs> is. So this um uh, this wheel, this um names of these colors only apply to oil or it, no it to all everything water color and they're pigment everything. names, Vivian. So they're. Their, uh, cadmium lemon, for example, exists in oil, exists in casein. So they are pigment name, not color name. Exactly. Right. They're not mm -hmm. right. Exactly. So they, right. Oh, so the, 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 uh, it seems that every, in every. In, I'm sorry. Oh, can you guys mute yourselves if you're not I, I, talking? I'm sorry. It's my, I, I, I turn uh, and mute myself. So. No um. There, I mean, there's no pigment names, sap green, for instance, that is a color name. These are color names and pigments as well. So like cobalt is a heavy metal that we use in batteries and things like that, but it's also a color. So you can buy cobalt blue and it's named cobalt blue, but it is also the pigment uh, as well. So it, it can be a little confusing, uh, like what is a pigment, what is a color? Uh, Mariana was using sap green as an example. There's no pigment called sap green. It's made with a bunch right. of different pigments put together and they're all completely different. So if you bought one brand of acrylic and you bought the tube sap green and you bought another brand of acrylic, you're probably looking at two different colors. And even in oil paints, we in my color theory class, we took uh, sap green from five year gap with the same company. And within mm -hmm. that five years, the pigment looked completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah, Windsor Newton is terrible because when you, whenever a company moves their manufacturing, so Windsor Newton was uh, started in England, then moved to France, and then then moved to China in their in terms of manufacturing. And every time they switch locations, their paint paints change dramatically. Uh, so it it's kind of tricky. And I think even when Williamsburg was bought by Golden, because originally it was uh, I think Carl Plansky is his name, uh, who ran Williamsburg Oil Colors. Um, I think. What happened when Golden bought Williamsburg oil paints, because Golden is a pro company, they made it more streamlined so there's less variation between the tubes of Williamsburg paints. You know, I'm, you know, I hope I'm not, right. not any manufacturing uh, uh, or saying anything wrong, but uh, it, there's less rogue quantities of oil in the paint now. Uh, and that's good or bad too, you know, it loses kind of the right. human quality of the handmade paints, but it is a little bit more, I, th I think closer to the way Holbein makes their paints where you know, Holbein's a Japanese company, uh, even though it's not a Japanese artist, but you know, you're looking at Holbein paints and from one year to the next, that paint is so consistent and it's, <laughs> not, and it's good paint too, but it's, it's not gonna vary from tube to tube. Right. Um, but one last thing about this, I don't know, can you see my pointer? I can't remember. Yeah, we can. Okay, so when you're looking at this and you're saying, well, how do I choose colors? A lot of artists will say, well, how do I choose between colors? Like, do I want high chroma colors or do I want kind of more muted palette? What you could kind of take from this, if I draw a line, it's fine, you see here. Da, 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 da. Let's take cobalt blue right here. And we'll take uh, what's quinacridone magenta right here. All the colors, on the interior, which would be over here, 
of my pointer, when I draw a line between those two colors, I can mix uh, if I have that that color. So all these colors in here, as long as I have a color, like we'll say I have phthalo green and I have cobalt blue and I have quinacridone magenta, I have this triangle. All the colors within the interior of my triangle, I can mix with those three colors. So right. all those pigments would sometimes in white and black are useful as well. All the pigments on the interior of this triangle, I can make all the colors I can make with this triangle in theory. Yes. And so anything on the other side of it, like this cobalt teal, I cannot make with it. Right. Does that make sense? Because it has a that higher- way we'd have to buy it because yeah, you cannot it's mix it. Yeah, it's actually do this in person. And I do this a lot with, uh, in the classroom when we especially do color theory. But I think that's a useful concept to have is when you're looking, especially in the cadmiums and you have cadmium yellow and you have cadmium red, like all the oranges, you can, all these ones right here, especially, <laughs> like these are useless colors in a lot of ways because a direct line between, you know, cadmium red and cadmium yellow right. is all these cadmium oranges. So it's like, do you need to have orange tube of paint? Probably not. Yeah. Right. You just need cad yellow and cad red, and, and it's and you'll be fine uh, avoiding any really any orange aside from like a prior yeah. orange, which is a much higher key uh, than you can get with a, any yellow and plus red. So, yeah. however, with the binder and the solvent, manufacturers can make the colors uh, that that I agree with Jordan are kind of useless in theory. They can make them more staining or more more luminous and so there is some other uh, aspects of colors that manufacturers can manipulate to for example i'm thinking of quinacridone gold that's in the band that you just mentioned jordan right. and everybody buys a quinacridone gold or just about <laughs> and uh, and the reason is that it's so wonderful when you apply it and and yes it's a middle yellow it's a kind of dirty yellow you know, there's nothing to it in, in the way if you look at the chart, but, um, but because it's so beautifully, um, it, it disperses so beautifully and it has different, it kind of a light application, it has a yellow hue. And when you put more, it looks brown and sometimes it looks gold. And so in that sense, we can be kind of uh, beautifully tempted uh, by um, by the binder and the combinations that that that, ma that manufacturers um, uh, use the how how they market and how they package right, right. the color. Um, um, I see two hands raised. Though, can we uh, uh, go ahead yeah, and ask Lynn? Would absolutely. you mind muting and asking your question, please? Yes, I um, my, I should tell everyone too. I'm a dermatologist, and I. Just one of my um, areas in dermatology is defining skin color and working with skin of color. And we're dermatology and medicine in general is working on um, skin sc scales of color of skin. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that artists can help us with this because I've actually talked with Byron Kim and we've had some great conversations about getting these scales right and, and making them more, um, scientific because there's so many factors you know that go into skin color just like they go into paint i actually did just copied a little chart and this i have meeting is being recorded plus melanin plus blood plus fat plus muscle you know they all give mm -hmm. you your final skin color um so my question is if with with artists is there if you're doing portraits do you or or you know anything that shows and are there I can see the sort of that middle range there of the sure. sort of brown, orange, yellow that do pull in everything. But do you end up um, using this kind of chart to to create this portrait, or is there a no. separate portrait thing? <laughs> yes and no, right? You know, uh, the, the 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 real the stretch here is is you know what is the color of skin? And I remember my high school teacher saying, I remember asking him the same question, like what. What, what do I do to mix skin color? And he's like, you mix all the colors together. And mm -hmm. I thought for a minute, I'm like, well, okay, that, do I add blue? And he goes, yes. Red, yeah. yes. Do I agree? Yellow, yes. And it was all, I mean, it's like, there's no, there's no silver bowl for any skin color. Yeah. And the, the real kicker is, it's not the color of the paint often, it's the light on the subject matter. So mm -hmm. when we set up a, a figure in the studio and, I, and we're really talking about flesh tones, 
yes, I can make a general color for uh, an Af you know, African-American skin tone or Muslim or whatever it may be, but I can change that color just by changing the color of the light that's touching the right. skin. So if I, use, if I do a spotlight of blue or a spotlight of warm, if I use outside lighting, all right. these factors really change the way that light bounces off the surface and then again, back into our eyes. So it, it's really situational for artists and especially representational artists uh, to capture the likeness because we're not just capturing the likeness of the person, we're capturing the distance from me to the model, the model within the environment, the lighting on the model and all these other factors. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. it's kind of, it, it really goes back to like a, an essay by Leonardo da Vinci, basically screaming about how much more difficult painting is than sculpture because painters have to create the illusion of a space and the subject within the space. And a sculptor, all they have to do is, you know, carve it out and let actual sunlight do the, the work of value and three-dimensional, you know, illusions. Mm -hmm. So I, I really wish there was a silver bullet for you, but I don't think there yeah. is. <laughs> of course, there, there are the silver bullet. bullet. But I think you all will, will be able to help a lot. And, you know, because we're moving now towards artificial intelligence and right. you know, they're looking and, and the artists are moving more to digital, doing digital art. I'm not sure how they're creating their colors. I mean, I guess it's the same thing with their vision and- Digital artists are probably using the additive color color wheel that we started off with. Yeah. But there's a little bit more, I think you have more of a range to work with too when you have add of color versus yeah. subtract right. color. Right. Um, so if you look at the <laughs> slide here, like we have the colors within the within the circle, but none of them are touching the edges of the circle. With an additive color where you're dealing with light, your yeah, color yeah. wheel goes to the edge mm -hmm. of this right. wheel. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And and some artists are experimenting with the uh, different colors for skin, for example, a series of uh, of people painted in greens. Mm -hmm. um, case too. Yes, yeah. and of course, the uh, as Jordan said, all the lights that the light has a lot of influence on how one is paint the skin colors painted, as well as what people are wearing mm -hmm. uh, and what they're near. Um, so because light also reflects off of some uh, of objects that surround, including clothing. Um, but um, do we answer your question right. to some did degree, Lynn? You no, know, you really did, and it's 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 fortunately it's going to pr prompt more work for you because I really want to get a <laughs> conversation. Anytime, we'd love to. I'd I love think to work with you. We really uh, have some, and Marianne and, and I will talk about this very. Yes, it's for, great to, to offer medical the med the doctors the medicine yeah right the medicine world not just doctors but healthcare providers too yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Trish, did you have a question? Trish Tyson? Yeah, I had a question and a comment. Sure. The comment was to point out that around the outside of the circle, they uh, <laughs> show complements that you can use to mix together. Um, yeah. I, you know, oh, are, you, are you talking directly across or, or on? The... Yeah. Yeah. Do you Possibly. There's theoretical compliments, Trish, because he has a whole section on how compliments are not, they don't match up on this or any other color wheel. Right, yeah. but it, it gives you a good a sense right. to look across. And yeah, it, it, is... that's a good point. Uh, I remember like when I first learned color theory that, you know, we say, well, the opposite of yellow is is purple and opposite of orange is blue and if you right. do this on the scale you take Hansa yellow and the opposite is ultramarine blue uh so yellow is the opposite right. of blue it's but we good. always think that makes this green but then you have to remember well ultramarine blue is or ultramarine is basically violet in this situation or mm -hmm. even like i think a, like a cobalt teal like a blue green is opposite of red so there's some right. kind of slight alterations to the original compliments right. that we uh, we worked with. Uh, and actually I'm gonna move to the next slide here too, maybe, yeah. which kind of work a little bit with this. I have to move my screens over. Um, and this is, if you see that hue thing on the side, there's there's three, ca three ca four categories actually, hue, value, chroma, and temperature. There you go. Oops. Mute yourself. Um, and with that hue, with the Monzel system, which I um, uh, will take a long time to actually. 
Yeah. Oh, is it? There we go. Um, so with the, with the Monzel system is, is something I go over in the color theory, but they were, they're really working with uh, the hue being on a more kind of working with that 10 point gray scale. So all the colors are mapped out in variations of 10, where if you're looking at like cadmium orange, it's five yellow R, that, that five number means it's like it's as purest form. So like Indian red and Athol red are both at red at their purest form, but the difference is the value and the chroma of those two colors. Uh, so it's a very mathematical way of looking at color using the Munzel system. And, and by the way, these are oil paints from gambling. Yeah. Uh, so Only they're gambling. Gonna different. They're going to be different from uh, from brand to brand, but gambling wasn't it was good enough to give the these standardized colors, the ones that at least I use quite a bit, uh, and and give you a more mathematical kind of simple way of looking at them. Uh, at least their specific colors, and I wish every paint brand would do this because it makes it a yeah. lot easier for me to describe a color. Like if somebody gave me the, the months of color uh, numbers and said, you know. Uh, Jordan, I'm, I'm at the art store. I have a, a 10 Y 8.5 dash 10. I would know that it's cadmium get lemon because it's 10 on the yellow scale. It's kind of moving towards green because it's such a high number. It's about to switch over to green at 10. And then the value is very high. It's, it's closer to sunlight, which would be, you know, sunlight is 10, remember. And the chroma is relatively high. So I can, I can yeah. picture what it looks like in my head. Uh, and I can, and I can, and then course the temperatures described there as well to eat it right. even better so to me like the Monzel system is really useful and the best part about it is it cannot be outdated uh, so well, many of the other uh, um, systems of color like Johannes Itten uh, have been outdated with with time and technology he used originally a, a, a 10 or sorry a 12 point gray scale uh, to describe value but because you have 12 it's hard to divide 12 and very easy to divide by 10 and cream like 8.5 for instance on that situation um so really really kind of nice i did throw in there uh, you can see a thalo blue i'll get to you in a minute james uh thalo blue and thalo green how low those chromos are but any normal artist who have actually used those chromos in the past go that's bonkers like i thalo is like the most wildly uh, color that i could come up with and why is thalo blue a 10 when it should be a 12? And why is thalo green a six? That doesn't make any sense. But the thalos are kind of a weird pigment and don't ask me how it does it, but whenever you add white to thalo, uh, it actually increases the intensity of that color. And I think what happens is they're so dense and so pigment, I guess, dark of a pigment to start off with that we can't really dis decide or see the, uh, the pigment itself in its pure form. But when you add a little bit of white to it, it enables us to kind of see the brightness of the color and the intensity of that color. So it actually increases in its uh, chroma to a point. And normally, whenever you add white to any of these colors, white, black, gray, or the complement, the chroma of a color decreases as you add those things, white, black, gray, and the complement. Mm -hmm. They low when you add white, it increases the chroma slightly, and then it starts to decrease at a kind of a point. But I have every color, let's take mono orange there with a chroma of 16. If I add white to mono orange, it moves it down to 15 to 14, you know, all the way to like zero or you know, in terms of chroma, depending on how much white I add to it or how much right. black or how much uh, gray I add to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just want to remind us that this is more of a color discussion than a pigment discussion, although it, it's of course related. Uh, and, and there's room for many more um, sort of discussions about that. Um, I didn't have a question yet. My question actually was more of a speculation, and this would apply to the mineral uh, colors. I'm, a, I'm guessing that when a manufacturer moves from Europe to China, yeah. using different mines in China near the headquarters of the new company to mine their cadmium or other earth pigments and that that's why you get variation when they switch cadmium orange from the oil. Right. It might, to, it might even be just new machinery too. I mean, a lot of the pigments come from everywhere all over the world. I mean, you get the best, best, the best earth tones are out of Australia and actually some of them are still in Italy even you know, like burnt sienna, sienna Italy, it's like the, all these. 
you know, pigments are named from them. And originally, yeah. the best lazul, which is the most valuable, it was more valuable than gold in Da Vinci's time period. Um, it was well, the, primarily Afghanistan. And we started wars in Afghanistan bef before oil and before all this because of pigment. You know, it's like we went and stole their lap vessel Zool and, and whatnot. But um, so it, it's not like all the pigments are coming from China all of a sudden. They're, they're still coming from all over the world, even in the yeah. USA. And we haven't even begun to explore Africa, for example, and many regions of the world that, you know, colorists haven't yet mined. My, yeah, so my, my guess is the manufacturing, I think it's probably new machinery and uh, and probably cutting corners would be my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, James, did you have a question? I think. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're always a wealth of information. I'm glad that I came <laughs> on this morning. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, I don't want to. Uh, the um, with the with the McAvoy. I've always had the question with that chart, mm -hmm. and um, kind of embarrassed to put this out here. But no. when I look at this chart, and we're talking about mixing the colors. You know, right. toward, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and then right in the middle, and yes. towards the middle, we have carbon black and titanium white yes. yep. so in my mind very good the, question right with the whole mixing of color things and i get these ad, ad, uh, additive and subtractive uh colors what are we looking at with both titanium white okay. and carbon black right yes. in the dead center yes so imagine another another dimension which is a top to bottom as opposed to another dimension coming out at you so that's the value dimension in Mansell that is what he means like um in one of the early slides that Jordan had um can you go back to it Jordan oh it's gonna be it. well here let me, it, let me try rephrasing it so think of it this is just the equator of the earth north pole yeah. is white light and south pole is is a uh, black black yeah. So in this, we're drilling a hole directly through the center of the earth. And this does not describe the light versus dark qualities of, of these colors at all. So, right. you know, even though Hansa yellow is near the top there, so we think it's bright, mm -hmm. you know, this would actually be closer to the North Pole in this situation on this sphere. Does that make sense? So he's compressing a different dimension. Right, the, so we're, we're looking at a two-dimensional map of something that's actually multi-dimensional. Three-dimensional. Yep. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Thank you, you got the third dimension. Absolutely, but only applies to black and white. The others are all relative inside the circle because we're talking about the color yeah. um, distances. And notice, by the way, in this, that there's very few colors in the thale, in between green and, and yellow like very few quote natural or synthetic colors. The same thing in the blues, in the, um, in the sort of purples, you can see how few there are and they're mostly not very chromatic, meaning that they're a little bit grayed out. They're not very vibrant, not in the subtractive scale. And it's partially is, due to lack of uh, purple photon receptors in our eyes and things like that too, so. <laughs> yeah, but also, no, we, don't, we just don't have the pigments yeah, that go yeah. there and are very um, yeah. chromatic. And yeah. maybe they'll, they'll fill out, you know. I think Yin Min would be even more closer to the edges. Uh, he didn't plot it here, but it might end up a little bit beyond ultramarine blue at the bottom. Yeah, women have much better abilities to see color than men do. We have men have better values, uh, being able to see dark versus light. But in terms of the difference between one color hue and a chroma versus another, typically females um, cones in their eyes are more sensitive to color than men. Um, yeah, but I'm not talking about perception. These are existing pi pigments. Yeah. They also don't exist as much in the in the they. These are all the known pigments, yep. at least for watercolors. When in there exist for watercolors, have mirror the world of pigments. And it's, are, it's a crime yeah. because we also see more variety of green than any other color. Right, exactly. That that is part of the point. Yeah, that's very yeah. good. But that's a good question, James. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very, for, thanks for putting that into words. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. I, I want to make a correction to something I said before. I said casein. I don't know why I said that. Casein is a combination of egg yolk. Casein is milk 
protein into the paint and it's parallel to adding yolk to pigment, which makes egg tempera, not casein. I apologize, I just misspoke, but- um, We knew what you meant. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Wait, one um, more question? So yeah, one uh, a quick question, and this is again, I'm, just something I don't didn't realize, but you were mentioning pigments being mined. Is that like really a big business? Is that? Uh, they, they're byproducts usually, I think, uh, and like mined as in from the earth, like uh, what Jordan was talking about, sienna, the siennas and burnt siennas and red siennas and so on, um, are Venetian red. They come from the earth. Yeah, um, yeah not from mines per particularly, although there may be in the, for example, in the lithium uh, extraction business, and there are very few places apparently in the world that have uh, deposits of lithium, and they're very craved uh, because of battery, you know, making battery. Yeah. And, um, and so there, there, it may be that they'll find new mining sites, and then they'll find new colors, just like Yinmin, although Yinmin was a, a synthetic. Mm -hmm. um, in its synthetic lab. Um, but yeah, that, that's what happens. But I don't think there are specific mines for color. There are. Yep. There are. Th th yep. There are? Yep. Yeah, there are. Um, and especially yeah. things like we were talking about the batteries, like cobalt is a major part of the new batteries for cars and stuff. Uh, right. And but, we're at a lack of it. Um, and now but we don't just, mine for cobalt blue. We mine for no, cobalt. No, we mine for the, even cobalt. But right, that's exactly. That's a little more broad. But even like the, the, I was saying that the, right. the earth tones in it that are coming out of Australia, we are mining them for paint. I mean, there's really, it's dirt, so it's not hard to do. It's, yeah, it's yeah. scraping it off the surface for the most part. But um but, but we are mining for all these pigments in general, um, okay. one way or another, cadmium, cobalt. These are, I mean, cerulean blue is actually cobalt. It's just cooked at a different temperature. So you take the pigment of cadmium and or cobalt and you bake it for X amount of time and it'll turn out this color and you bake, bake it a little longer, it'll turn out to be this color. So huh. cadmium yellow and cadmium red are exactly the same mineral. Mineral, um, right. Cooked right. longer yeah. and baked longer yeah. in the oven. <laughs> and some of the yellows are actually byproducts of cobalt too. Um, I was reading in the National Gallery has an incredible treatise on on colors yeah. um, yeah. that that are downloadable. But the, you know we are constantly having a, a, a change over in pigments. So we're, you know back in Rembrandt's and Vermeer's time period, there wasn't titanium white. We had flake white, which to get flake white you had a big lead bar, and then you suspended over bats of vinegar and the, the fumes from the vinegar create little white crystals on the outside of the lead bar. And then your studio assistant would take a knife and start scraping off the crystals and then grind them up into a and powder. And they died, yeah. Add oil, and then you have white paint. That's the only way that we had white paint at that time period. Um, and a lot of people died. Right. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you, right. you can see like the longevity of an artist's life as technology improved and we didn't have to use lead white as often or at least knew right. about it. So now artists live into their hundreds before you have Jericho dying in his 20s. So it's right. And the new science is showing, by the way, that artists have a lot of high longevity, that people who do art live a little bit longer. Yeah. And they think it's because of stress relief and so on. <laughs> but that's another topic for another time. Another topic. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we wanted to just go over in the few minutes we have left. Uh, we don't have any minutes left, but how you read these um, characteristics in, in a paint tube. And this is a Windsor Newton watercolor. So they usually, if, you, if we're lucky, they'll give us the permanence, um, the series. Well, the series is an internal thing uh, for the company, but the, the color name, of course, and its light fastness and sometimes the opacity. If you go on Jordan, you'll see in other tubes of other paints that are not watercolor. Um, like for example, this is oil, uh, no acrylics, I'm sorry. You, you see how uh, golden, but only golden and very, uh, maybe Liquitex also show you a paint sample on top of black bars and they show you, so you can tell the opacity sort of in an intuitive way rather than read it as a number um, and so on. And, Keep going, Jordan, because I don't want to keep people too long. And this is a very idealized, this is Michael Harding oil paint. It's handmade in England. Um, you can see that uh, unlike other 
people, they give you the, art, the light fastness, but they also give you the drying time. And what they mean, I think, is average oil drying time. They don't have a, a scale for drying time. So it's, it's only to show that they didn't add a retarder or something like that. And I think you can tell it's mostly linseed oil, that grounded linseed oil, you see. And some, some uh, manufacturers will combine different oils. And it's staining power, that's nice. Now, the next slide, if you don't mind for a couple more minutes, um, just a warning that we kind of said this before, but cobalt blue can actually contain cobalt blue. But many manufacturers, especially lesser quality paints, but not always, will call cobalt blue a mixture of thala blue and ultramarine. So it's the first and third tube I'm comparing. So you get the, um, sometimes it, the same name does not mean that the same pigment is included. So that's why it's important to look at the pigment composition for the manufacturers that give it to you, not all do. And also that they can call uh, something else like cyanin blue, the same ingredients that are in cobalt blue. So just to, uh, to be aware as consumer artists that we um, need to kind of fend for ourselves a little bit in understanding the colors that are included in our tubes. And this is similar to that sap green discussion we had earlier where you yeah. know, sap green can have like, we'll take like a yellow and a blue for this, for instance, and have the same, not quite the same ratio between you know, your, your, let's say a Hansa yellow and uh, I don't know, ultramarine blue. Uh, it, you could have any variations within that, and that's why each brand of, of paint is different from one to another, even though they're the same exact pigments. Right. Next slide, Jordan. And so if you look within oils, for example, you also have this variation of the amount of linseed oil that is needed for a tube of the different colors. And there is a variety and why. You can see the proportion of oil is different for some of the colors than others. And so the why has to do with, I believe the next slide that's coming. And it's, um, this is a hard thing, but don't, don't focus necessarily on, on the charts. All we want to say is that um, manufacturers must determine a critical pigment to volume concentration. It's called CPVC. And I think of it and we think of it as a sweet spot of the pigment and binder relationship. So there is a place at which enough of the binder and enough of the pigment make the best paint. And that is that sweet spot that they must arrive at for each color. And that's why the amount of binder may need to vary between a color and another color of the same manufacturer. I'm gonna to skip to the next. Because that also tells you. Yeah, what. a lot of it's also, yeah. you know, you'll notice in your own paints that some oil paints will dry faster than the other. And it's quantity of oil, yes. too, uh, or even the type of oil that the manufacturer will use in a paint. Um, you can't just use a, a small amount and a lot of pigment, as Marion will discuss in a minute. Yeah, this, this chart is very visual, and I tend to be very visual. So I love that you know, at very low on the left, if you look at the very low concentrations of pigment, um, you don't get a very good color probably, right? I mean, this is a generic list, but if you get to too much pigment, you also lose because you have an increase in voids, what they call apparently the pig, when pigment is too saturated within the binder, it doesn't behave well. And, and it sort of, um, it, it develops what they call a haze. And so the, bit, the pigment doesn't show to its best. So someone somewhere between 50 and 60% is the idealized combination in most um, pigment uh, to binder concentrations. This comes by the way from the just Paint newsletter from 2016. Um, it's the golden newsletter and if you haven't subscribed to it, it's free, it's really nice. It's a little bit too technical sometimes, so you have to kind of read it a couple of times or just don't, not read it, but it's very, very good what they're doing. It's essentially scientific articles on, on how they do things. 
Um, next slide. And so um, for acrylic oil and casing in this particular slide is what the Just Paint newsletter has compared. So on the left, you have the, uh, for acrylics, the binder in the, the case of acrylic is uh, some mostly water, but there's also the other like stabilizers like glycerin and polymer, et cetera. In oil, we know it's either linseed oil or a combination of oils. In casing, it's mostly pigment in water. So the next slide, the next, I'm sorry, the next uh, image 11 shows you that when uh, the percentage of water that's in that, in that uh, binder um, for acrylic oil and casing. And at, this is after it dries. So with the water at, um, uh, casing with a water component added back in, if they gave you the water. And on the last one is after it dries. And um, so this is a reason that sometimes, um, so, so the percentage is, um, um, anyway, I, I think this slide, I don't have time to go into, into this one. This I think it's a little bit too, um, it's complex, but as you can see that the, the amount of pigment, which is the blue, part is varying um, in the in the in each tube and sometimes um, casein has you can see that it has the highest amount of pigment per se and sometimes we say that watercolors or casein in this case contain most more pigment than oils of acrylics well that is a, that that's true but it doesn't mean that they're more chromatic or luminous it just means that it has a, an interaction with the binder that requires more pigment to be inside the tube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it, it goes to the difference between what, what do you do? Why we tell you to buy like non-student grade, if you can afford it, just buy the better, the better quality paint. And the reason is how different manufacturers manipulate this ratio of the pigment to binder. If they're gonna use less pigment, they're gonna to have to determine the critical concentration, pigment to value concentration. And that's, a, um, that's why we tell you to buy a better paint if you can afford it. Yeah. Uh, because then you have different, the color may look exactly the same in the craft and student grade and artist grade, but then when you try to use it, it may be paid differently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so next, I think it's Jordan. Once. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit about layout, and this is way over the time. Sorry about that, but just in, and just so you have an idea of what is probably overkill and what is necessity for a, a painting. Uh, this is kind of my palette before a, a large abstraction, so I, I was really after a lot of colors here. And just my pointer here, I, I have my earth tones on one side of the palette, and I have my variety of whites. I had a, a warm and a cool white on this particular uh, painting. So I, I do group my earth tones just so I remember. Uh, I am the opposite of a lot of artists who will say, always mix compliments to create your grays. I find that very expensive because if you're going to mix a cadmium and a cobalt, that both those tubes cost about $40 versus the earth tones only cost about $10. Uh, so I'm very uh, uh, liberal with my earth tones and I think that's fine. Uh, so if you're gonna dull something down, this is kind of where I go in my palette first to dull any of these brighter colors down. I think that's just a healthy habit. And it works for the old masters, it can work for me too. Um, my cadmiums, uh, like I said earlier, all these colors are probably useless. The yellow, and actually the magenta over here, are probably all you really need for most of these colors aside from alizarin and crimson. And one thing I forgot to mention about alizarin and crimson, whenever you buy it, make sure it's permanent alizarin and crimson, not just plain alizarin and crimson. Yeah. The permanent alizarin and crimson is made with more uh, light fast and uh, pigments that will survive over the years. The original alizarin and crimson is closer to like a rose matter, which is a little bit more fruit or, right. uh, well, I guess susceptible to fading over time. So be aware <laughs> of your type of alizarin and crimson, uh, right. just because it's longevity. Uh, I think at the time I was using a purple and I think I dropped that. Uh, the two blues though, I do think it is important to have one blue ultramarine that leans towards purple and one blue, this is cerulean that leads towards green. Uh, mm -hmm. That way, when you're thinking about what type of blue you need, 
you can just make a judgment call on, is it more purple that I'm after or more green of a blue that I'm after? And same thing with, you know, all your colors, like your, your uh, I have a Viridian green, which is leans towards blue and a sap green. I think I was using Williamsburg that leans towards yellow. And I think for whatever reason, I felt the need to add an additional yellow, lemon yellow to kind of loop back my color wheel. So I think I was just doing this for show to be honest, <laughs> uh, but then here's the kind of circle there. Um, you do not need that many colors though. You know, looking at John Singer Sargent's palette, uh, a lot of these are no longer available simply because, well, different locations in the world or, you know, things like here, like uh, a rose matter, you, that really is not a good color to use anymore because uh, it's made from rose petals, which will dull and fade over time. So what you would substitute his palette with, with is a permanent loser of crimson. Uh, this is his oil palette for his watercolors will be a different palette. Um, and largely he worked in the warmer spectrum. So most of his paintings are on the hotter side. Uh, aside from cobalt blue there the, and Viridian, uh, you're looking at a very warm palette, all things considered. Um, and mm -hmm. somebody like Whistler, kind of similar thing. Uh, there's that rose matter again, so be very wary of yeah. using colors like that. But here's that flake white, which is a lead white paint. Right. It's very warm. It's a very luscious paint. Um, Jenny Saville said, like, you know, it's the reason why we have oil paint is to paint flesh. And flake white paint for portraits specifically, it reflects light the way skin colors reflect light. So painting done with flake white paint, in theory, is going to feel more lifelike and feel more like flesh on that surface, at least by Jenny Saville and many, oh, Lucian Ford as well, actually, was the same kind of way, would not use anything but flake white in the figurative paintings. Um, you can still acquire flake white with lead in it. Other manufacturers, including Gamblin, have created a flake white replacement. I don't care for it. Oh. Give me lead. <laughs> <laughs> Even with substitute lead. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing. Like you can use cadmiums, cobalts, and leads. Just don't eat them. Yeah, As don't, well don't, adults, don't you know, let your not. kids or pets. Yeah, eat. so when I had kids in the studio, I didn't use flake white. I didn't use uh, cobalts and cadmiums because, you know, little baby Jackson crawling on my floors in my studio, I was a little bit worried of what was on the floors. But for the most part, uh, if you don't ingest these, these uh, harmful pigments, uh, you'll, you'll be fine. If you get it on your skin, you'll be fine because heavy metals can't be absorbed into your skin. Right. Really dangerous about oil paints is actually the fumes from your uh, Gamsol, from your turpentine. Uh, those will cause lung issues or have uh, other issues. I know yeah. some artists have a, uh, a, an allergy to the smell of oil. I know Christine Lashley, for instance, uh, could not be around mineral spirits, number one. I think she does use uh, water-soluble oils, but I also know she can use normal oils as long as right. she removes the solvent from that uh, equation, which is very doable. And we could talk to you about substitutes for solvents on another day. Yeah, that would be a good discussion, I think. it's Doesn't, yeah, talk about solvents. Uh, Renoir, there's that flake white again. Uh, and, and there's a lot of colors like uh, emerald green. I think he was using Vernice green at the time. Uh, there's a lot of colors here uh, that are probably, uh, would say a lot about Vermeer as a person too. Yeah. Very, very color based. Monet, surprisingly not as many colors, but there you go. I think that's our last slide. So yeah, yeah. we did Great. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone for bearing with us. There's really a lot of information. And See, if you have we're questions, only 20 minutes over, know. Mariana. That's yeah, so right, no, just half an, hour, yeah, half an hour more. But I, I can also put the, um, the link to the downloadable books by the National Gallery, because they really go, like Jordan showed the palettes of the masters. They have a real examination of what, uh, over the years, that they would be, what they, the paints would be equivalent to and how they discovered what they actually their original paints were uh, which is really fascinating but it's like three tomes or it's actually four volumes of each one is about 400 pages so it's not easy reading but it's fun to have it yeah, um, so I could put the link for volumes one to three are the ones that are available the other ones you have to buy for a lot of money um, but anyway I can put that link also. Thank you, everybody.
Mm-hmm. And Any let us know questions? if you have questions later. You. you can just email us. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy. And Thanks, you guys. too. Bye bye. Thanks, JJ.